Now, one of the things that I was starting to talk about a little bit are the transcendent categories. Transcendent categories in the Kantian sense are a priori assumptions or rules of inference, if you prefer. I'm not exactly sure what the correct precise term is for, for it. But these are things that you decide a priori ahead of time. They are, in fact, the preconditions of intelligibility. When, when the presuppositionalists, I know, they, those guys saw it, Craig, <laughs> I know, but, but that's actually true. The transcendent categories are the preconditions of intelligibility. The very essence of theoretical physics, you've got this whole thing of like, you can't falsify, you know, um, uh, you can't prove that the spaghetti monster, uh, invisible spaghetti monster isn't on Alpha Centauri. Well, it's not really true. As soon as you start ascribing, you can't prove an invisible unicorn isn't there, or something like that. That's what the atheists always say. This isn't true. As soon as you start ascribing locality and attributes, then you can falsify whatever it is you are postulating. This is the very essence of theoretical physics. Prior to making investigations, scientists are able to rule things out of the realm of possibilities using only mental abstractions and rules of inference. So, to keep it simple, for example, if I say, you know, an invisible pink unicorn on Alpha Centauri, fine, maybe that's not falsifiable. But if I say, if I ascribe attributes and locality, so I say a visible unicorn in the kitchen, then you can look in the kitchen and go, well, there isn't, why? Because I would, there isn't a visible unicorn in the kitchen. Why not? Because I would see it. So just to keep it simple, you can rule things out of the realm of possibility using a priori rules of inference. And they are, in fact, the preconditions of intelligibility. So prior to investigation, you have reasons why you decide why your hypo hypothesis, why one set of hypotheses is more plausible than another. So you don't just investigate any old thing under the sun. Hey, I got empirical investigation. Let's cut this almond in half, okay? And let's paint one part, one half blue, and we'll paint the other half yellow, and then we'll glue it back together and see what happens. Okay. <laughs> Why are we doing that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you see? You can, you can make a lot of empirical investigations about, you know, irrelevant stuff. The whole point of investigating scientifically is that you are heading in some sort of direction and there's some sort of reason for your investigating this as opposed to that. And that's where you get into the realm of the theoretical, where you rule things out of the realm of possibility using only rules of inference and a priori assumptions. Now, given that all that is true, those a priori rules of inference actually exist even though they don't have locality. They actually exist. This is why I keep insisting the presuppositional arguments are stronger than they appear. The things that Matt Dillahunty agreed to, agreed to in his debate with the two times he debated the, the, the halfway decent presuppers, Tyler Vila and Jay Dyer, he agreed that there are laws of logic. He agreed that they are inviolate. They cannot be any other than thus. He agreed that they are transcendent in nature that exist outside of space and time. He basically agreed to entities, provable facts, or entities as known entities in the world that are really, really close to what a Christian is already talking about when they are talking about God. Really close. That's the point. And now we start to add physics into the equation. And as I've said, I mentioned where I had this conversation with Jeffrey, I'm about to say Jeffrey Dahmer. No, not the serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Williams. And yes, I can't believe that I'm saying this, but part of the reason why I wanted to have the conversation when he asked me to come on his channel was that unlike most of the people in this space who write down things about um, physics, when he does his, uh, you know, um, 15 tweets about physics, I read his stream of tweets and like, yeah, that's all, that all checks out. So he was mentioning two people in particular, uh, Penrose, and Cavelli, I believe, is the guy's name. I always forget the guy's name. Cavelli. Cavelli. Andiamo. Andiamo. Hey, why are you talking about physics all the time? Mangia lasagna. 
Andiamo, che, che, che è successo? Che belli. Um, yeah, no, I've said that a lot. All right, fine. That's <laughs> why my voice gets on my case. Whenever I start getting something I like doing, I'll say it over and over and over again, just to drive her insane. Um, I don't know, it's fun. So I like doing things like that. No reason. Um, so what was I talking about? Okay, so in the conversation with Jeffrey Williams, which was a pretty cool conversation, I recommend you check it out. He started telling me about Cavelli's postulates, about what is actually at the fundamental level of quantum reality. Quantum fields, there are certain things um, that, it, so what he was starting to tell me is that there are, it's I guess a theory of quantum consciousness where there is con quantum fields and at the furthest, where you break things down at the furthest level, you know, you have... Uh, Basically, at the fundamental level, you have waves of probability and patterns and excitations. That's a, basically a given fact. Every physicist will tell you that. Now, if those are also the entities that produce consciousness, which could very well be, okay, if these quantum interactions and our experience of consciousness is somehow us experiencing this at the, at the conscious, that's what consciousness is, that could very well be. That is perfectly consistent with at least some types of idealism. And, furthermore, it's, it's getting right on the doorstep if we're talking about God in two ways. See, what everybody throws God when we start talking about God is they, get, they have all these God ideas where there's all this baggage involved. The baggage doesn't necessarily need to be there. If we're talking about God, there are two theological ideas to keep in mind. Transcendent, imminent. Transcendent God is basically generic God, the God that, you know, even people who don't go to church kind of sort of believe in, the great big lovey-dovey loves us all, and most people think great God will come from the sky, take away everything, and make everybody feel high. That God, just a sort of generic omni-God, he's this great big lovey-dovey thing, and he loves us, he loves us all so much, just don't touch your winner. Then he'll send you to hell. <laughs> that God, most people kind of sort of believe in that God, even the nons. Now, that's as opposed to transcendent God. That's where you're talking about, or imminent God, which is specific Christian revelation that is only available to Christians by the Holy Spirit. And perhaps people of other religions, but it is imminent. When, when a Christian talks about God, they're usually talking about a combination of the two, but oftentimes they're referring to Jesus as the friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now that imminent God can only be located by you through prayer, I think, and it can only be discovered by you. But that transcendent God is basically the same thing as these patterns and oscillations that are the fundamental building blocks of reality. If these are actually the waves of consciousness, which is very imminently plausible. Now, like I said, I've just started checking out Cavelli, but my experience with, Jay, with Jeff is that when he starts talking about physics, you know, what, what, what is actually being discovered on the frontiers of physics, my understanding of this guy Cavelli is the preem one of the most preeminent physicists in the world. And my experience with Jeff is that when he starts talking about physics, he's not talking out of his butt. He's actually telling you what, what, what is actually being discovered at the frontiers of physics. The actual scientific realities and facts. So I'm going to assume for argument's sake that he's telling me the truth. Okay, that's basically transcendent God. <laughs> basically God. And when you start, without being too complex about it, because, you know, I realize a lot of you... It basically, when you, when you start talking at this level, if you are not struggling to understand it, you are not doing it correctly. So if you are not struggling to, that's the mistake that a lot of people are making on Twitter and YouTube, and that's how you can tell when someone doesn't know what they're talking about. Why? Because they start acting like they really know what they're talking about. And if you aren't struggling to understand this stuff, when we start talking about, you know, hard problem of consciousness and quantum mechanics, if you personally aren't struggling to understand it, you're not doing it right. If you think you're going to come and tell me and shut me down, doing it like a debate me bro, I promise you, you're a clown, you're, you're a junior leaguer. You're embarrassing yourself. You don't even understand how complicated it is. So you should be struggling to understand this stuff or you are not doing it correctly. But let's assume for argument's sake that I'm going to read Cavalli, which I've already started doing, and the physics are going to check out with what Jeffrey's saying, which I pretty much assume is going to happen. We're already sort of talking about transcendent God. 
according to the physics. We are talking about something very similar. No, it's not a God that's personal necessarily. And it's going to punish you when you touch a wiener. He might. <laughs> Those physics calculations might. So I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I thought it was funny. You know, whatever. I can't help it if you guys are just going to refuse to have a sense of humor. You know, go listen to somebody else's videos. Um, but we are already sort of talking about something remarkably similar to what a concept of God is. Interesting fact. And this is a fact. If you go study Vedanta Hinduism, all the way back then, some of the things that they were postulating by sheer intuition or perhaps through their rituals, whatever, are largely similar to some of the things that the German idealists, particularly Schopenhauer and Kant, people are going to be referencing a lot, talk about, which are things that are starting to be, it looks like physics is right on the doorstep of discovering as provable fact. Provable fact at the fundamental building block of reality, waves of probabilities and patterns and excitations. When you take a measurement, and this gets misunderstood a lot by the people we were talking to, okay, forever entangled in the measurement is the conscious observer. They cannot be disentangled from a physics experiment, from a series of equations. They are forever entangled, and it isn't just the idea that the observation so some guy was trying to argue with this on, phys on Twitter, like a debate me bro, basically. Debate me bro, I got you, I nailed it. Whenever someone starts talking like that, walk away. Why? Because you can't understand this stuff at that level to like shut you down in the debate. You're a clownish if you think you can. You don't get it if you think you can. Somebody starts being triumphant in a debate, I'm not going to name his name, he starts going, I'm crushing you. That guy's ridiculous. That guy's ridiculous. Nobody crushes anybody in philosophy of mind, and nobody crushes anybody in quantum mechanics. People struggle to understand this stuff, or they're not doing it correctly. Nobody crushes anybody. If the person who said, he crushed you in the debate, is the clown. Period. That's a basic paradigm of reality. That means they don't understand what they're talking about. Promise. And this guy started pulling that, that crap. So I was, I was done with him. <laughs> he called me Buddy the fifth time. Hey, Buddy, uh, you, you know, he starts saying you, you just got to do it. It's idiotic. You're dealing with the, with the fourth grader at that point. So I decided this guy's wasting my time. And then sure enough, he started wasting Jeffrey's time. Sure enough, he was. Because the thing he was trying to argue for was borderline ridiculous. You cannot un disentangle the conscious observer from the experiment. That's the essence of the measurement problem. And he was trying to say it doesn't have to be a conscious observer. That's ludicrous. I assume he means that there can be a measuring device. Okay, that doesn't solve the problem. Measurement devices are not part of nature. They don't appear out of thin air. They are built by what? By a conscious agent. <laughs> by somebody. <laughs> they don't just appear there. If a measuring device was in some part of the natural order of things, sure. But it isn't. It's something that is built by a conscious agent. Trying to get the physics to account for the conscious agent is the complicated part. Bordering on well-nigh impossible. So if you aren't struggling to understand it, you aren't doing it right. You get it? There are theories out there on the table, but they are starting to become at least the beginning stages of consensus. But none of those interpretations are, or anything I've told you is contingent on any one of them beating out anybody else. What they all agree on, to some degree or another, is that at the fundamental level we are talking about waves of probabilities and patterns of excitation. And what happens when you take a measurement, now this is just me, and I'm not a physicist, so take it with a grain of salt, but I think the more important thing that's happening than it's being observed, which is causing the collapse of the wave function, is I think you are assigning locality. Measurement means specific time and place. You measured something right then and there. You have now assigned locality to it. Hence, it is particle. It is no longer a wave of probability. It has actually occurred then and there in time and place. That's what I really think the collapse of the wave function is. Now, that's theoretical. And I don't have the standing to prove that through physics. But to me, that makes a lot of sense as the more important part of the collapse of the wave function is assigning locality.
because you are taking a wave of probability and you're actualizing it in here and now, time and place. That's where the measurement occurs. Then it can't be changed. Why? It's happened. It's there. Prior to that, it is a wave of probability. Now, materialism depends on standalone ontology to the real material world. That's the entire postulate. If there, if there is no standalone ontology to the material world, and reality check, there isn't. Waves of probabilities. Every physicist will tell you that. That's what's going on at the quantum level. Every physicist will tell you that. Doesn't matter which interpretation ultimately wins out. Materialism depends on material substance being the fundamental building block of reality, and that is just logically not tenable. It cannot be. Why? First, a lot of different reasons, but one of the most important and obvious is the one I just said. You can't disentangle the conscious observer. So materialism, material cannot be the ontological primitive. Can't. Period. Over. So if the choice is binary between idealism and materialism, idealism wins. Now, whatever Jeffrey's talking about is a kind of in-between idealism and some other thing. And most of the stuff he's talking about made complete sense to me, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be backed up by the physics. It's, it still could be a kind of idealism. And what we are talking about when we talk about these abstractions at the quantum level, these arguments about physicists, okay... And by the way, the, if I'm right about the assigning of localities, the actual important thing that, that corresponds nicely with IP's emergence argument of physics. It's basically essentially what he's arguing. Hasn't structured it so that that's perfectly crystal clear, but that's basically what he's arguing. Prior to observation, prior to measurement, prior to your life actually existing, there is a wave of probability. That's a given. That's a fact. And then what happens is the thing becomes actualized. Then once it is actualized, it's no longer problem why it actually took place here and there. Here, there, this precise time in this location, and it cannot be undone. Why? It's collapsed. Away. That's, uh, in essence, what the collapse of the wave function is. Now, people have been understanding this, and what was interesting about Jeff talking to Jeff, he calls himself an atheist, but so much of the stuff that he, he knows through philosophy and physics, I, German idealism seems to be one of his main influences. Um, you know, so much of the stuff is actually, it's really theist-friendly territory. Really, really, really theist-friendly territory. Most of your out there in the world atheists are, are scientists. They're super excited about scientists. But it's Stone Age science, materialism, eliminative materialism that we're finding out. We basically knew in the 1920s couldn't be true. And what we are trying to do is deal with the fact that scientists come to grips with the fact that the reigning dogma of their community is over. And how they're ultimately going to come, come to grips with it. Why? Because everything I just told you is true. The, the waves and patterns of uh, 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 excitation at the quantum level, that is basically what people are talking about when they talk about transcendent God. It's that. And those things are essentially provable fact. That is not an eminently implausible, that is eminently plausible God. Why? It is, it is consistent with the laws of physics and the sum total of the natural laws. It's basically a Schopenhauer God. You can still sort of be an atheist, and know that that transcendent, what we are calling God, is actually there. Why? Because that's what we're talking about. That's not imminent God. That's not Jesus is the friend who sticks closer than a brother. That's not the God that I find in my prayer closet when I go, Jesus, help me. Jesus, come and save me. That's transcendent God. But that basically, more or less, what we are talking about is provable facts. And yeah, that's not the God that I'm talking about. Matt Dillon will, will, will say this. I've heard him say this exact thing. And if you're an atheist, you'll probably say this exact thing. That's not the God that, that all the baggage is associated with. You know, the pray to God and stop you from touching weird, burn in hell. No, it's not that God. Quite. Or understood properly. Pretty close, actually. But it's not quite that God, no. <laughs> but it's... More or less on the doorstep of provable, provable facts. Everything Jeffrey... Di Jeffrey Dahmer, <laughs> you want to call you serial killer? Why don't you want to associate with a serial killer? I don't know, that scares me too. <laughs> Jeffrey Dahmer 
everything Jeffrey told me that I basically agree with almost everything he said. You should listen to the conversation. I basically agree with almost everything he said, and most of the stuff he said is provable fact. Provable fact. Very little of it isn't. Even when you're talking about high-level philosophy, the reason why we care about some high-level philosophy versus others is because it has already passed the, the peer-reviewed test. We're still talking about Schopenhauer and Kant. Why? Because those ideas have transcended their time and place. They offered really valuable insights into the nature of how things actually are. That's why we still care what they say. Aristotle somewhat... That's why we still care what they say. They've already proved their worth. But these, all, these ideas all feed into each other. They're all part of the same sort of philosophical, theological stew, as it were. Um, so, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I'm, I guess I'm rambling a lot, Craig. All right, fine, whatever. Ultimately, it's a YouTube video. Let's see how much time I have. Fine. 20 minutes. You know, I, I guess I'll wrap it up. I got a lot to say more about these subjects. Um, everything that he, Bernardo Castro and Jeffrey Williams don't call themselves call themselves atheists. They don't believe in God. The reason they don't believe in God, I fully accept. They haven't gone into their prayer closet and found some sort of conscious, you know, in prayer, contacted Jesus, the friend who will stick closer than a brother. So they don't believe that 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 being is conscious and exists. I accept that. I would not expect anybody to believe in God other than having a religious experience. I really wouldn't. It's the only reason I believe in God. That's why it's the bread and butter of almost everything I argue when I'm trying to prove God. It's the religious experience itself wherein you go, hey, wait a minute. This really does seem like somebody's listening to me. It really does seem like someone is interacting with me. And they really do seem to be conscious and omnipotent. And I really do seem to have answered prayers. So that's the only, that's the, the stuff that we're talking about with the transcendent physics. Everything he said is basically provable fact, more or less. Including the part where he talks about playing the guitar so much that he, he felt like the guitar was playing him. That's part of why I started believing God prior to me becoming a Christian. Because I knew about stuff like that through direct experience. Those are readily known experiences that people have. Almost every really powerfully creative person has, has described some variation of that. I felt like the play was writing me. Go look at uh, Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. It's actually a classic play. It's not overrated at all. It's really a cool play. I, I, high schools I really like got into it a lot. It's way better than you think. There's a reason why people think it's a classic. It's great. There's a Dustin Hoffman version on PBS that's really good. I am Willie Woman and you are Biff Loman! It's really good. I promise. It does sound good. Craig sounds stupid. All right, well, whatever. Um, go up, go home. Um, 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 this, the genesis of that particular play, which is what put Arthur Miller on the map, made him famous. He locked himself into a room, for, into a cabin in the woods, and said, I have to create this right now. It's like burning through me. And his experience he would have described as spiritual. Go look at any powerful creative person and you will see variations on this same theme. Anyone you name. Dostoevsky, I don't care who you name. There's variations on this exact same theme. Now, it could be, as Jeffrey was talking about, a bottom-up approach that that's, I, I'm perfectly accepting. I'm perfectly cool with that. Doesn't have to be top-down, you know a bit more flexible interpretation of what we're calling God, let's say. It doesn't have to be top-down, I command you, stop touching a wiener. I command you. <laughs> I'm not the one who put that out there, man. I swear to God, I'm not. Sam Harris, and, and, and it was echoed by Matt Dillard. I say it all the time because they say it all the time. <laughs> and they say, guess what thing they don't want? Guess why they don't want God to exist? Guess what they feel guilty about doing? I don't know. I'll take a while, guys. But not that God. I command you this day, you shall go forth. And if you touch your wiener even once, I shall destroy all your livestock and salt the land and kill all your children. That God <laughs> isn't quite the God we're talking about in quantum mechanics. That's not actually even really the God of the Bible, even the Old Testament. That's all ludicrous mythology. There's plenty of lovey-dovey God in the Old Testament. There's plenty of God loves you, you know, there's plenty of Jesus as a friend who will stick closer than the brother in the Old Testament. Yeah, there is. Tons. 
I will hide you in the shadow of my wings. There's tons and tons and tons of God as love in the Old Testament to even. It's just that everyone gets tripped out on the God as wrath. <laughs> that's what I tell. That's where I would, But mostly you get tripped out on that voice because you were raised as a fundamentalist Christian. Because they really dramatically exacerbate that voice and they make it really prominent and so that it feels like it's chasing you around all the time. That's why you get so tripped out about it. They planted that in you. If you grew up secular like I grew up secular, it doesn't even occur to you to start thinking of God that way. Really doesn't. Really doesn't. That Jesus is the friend who sticks closer than the brother makes complete sense. <laughs> I could use a good friend. <laughs> I could use a friend that sticks. That sounds really fun. That sounds really good. So, anyways, yeah, I guess I'm rambling. I'm rambling a lot at this point. That's fine. Whatever. Um, most of what I think, most of what I think is going to happen is we are on the frontiers. I'm pretty sure I'm going to follow up on Penrose and I'm going to follow up on Cavelli. And it's going to check out, just as Jeff, Jeff said it did, because most of the time when he talks physics, he's not talking out of his butt. Neither is he talking out of his butt when he talks about Schopenhauer, German idealism. He understands this stuff pretty well. Um, so I assume that the physics is going to check out. Now, as far as I'm concerned, we are already on the doorstep of talking about something akin to transcendent God. Like I said, no, that's not Jesus. That's not Jesus Christ to be revealed through the Holy Spirit, but it's transcendent God. Uh, it's, as far as I'm concerned, that's what we're already talking about. You can disagree with that if you want to. It just doesn't matter to me. But it's that, those patterns and oscillations that are the fundamental wave patterns underneath reality are provable fact. To one degree or another, that's what physicists are talking about. So, we aren't talking about anything wildly irrational and, you know... You know, I prayed and the ceiling fell in and angels came in, I don't know, <laughs> and dissected my liver. So I don't know what they did. <laughs> angels came in and dissected my liver. Yeah, that's a weird thing for them to do, but what, what, do, you, what do you got? What do you want? <laughs> they, they, they had some time to kill. <laughs> it's just, Craig, we need to dissect his liver. I don't know. Why? I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, so that was a little ridiculous. All right, so fine. Fine, I will wrap it up. That is all for now. Mass is in. I think we learned something, but... Who knows? If not, there's a new video coming probably tomorrow. So, doesn't really matter. There'll be more videos to come. Mass has ended. Go in peace. Amen.